get laid at Toronto, and um, we end up uh, at uh, arrived at uh, all of around one a.m. this morning. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm, I'm double happy to be here. <laughs> um, and uh, not only to be here, I think you know, it's the fact that this college classroom um, really feels thrilled. I have been out of college for many years. And this really makes me feel young. <laughs> <laughs> and also, not only that, I know there's a whole audience. There's only a few females here, so I hope we're visible enough to get your attention. All right, let me get started. So, um, I, my name is Gabi. I'm from Microsoft. Um, the whole Microsoft's free BSD-based team is actually based in Shanghai, and uh, the only uh, committer we have is also in Shanghai team. Uh, for the BS Committer. So um, I I'm really honored to be here to um, share what Microsoft has been doing with FreeBSD and, uh, and what we're up to. So um, let's get started here. So um, I think, um, first of all, I, I don't, I want to kind of evangelize this again and again because uh, it's, 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 it's such a, a change from Microsoft's perception. I have to say it again, you know, the importance has to be repeated again and again. Ever since our new CEO, Satya, made the landmark statement um, two and a half years ago, October 20, 2014, says we really Microsoft loves Linux, that really astonished the world a little bit. And uh, <laughs> with that statement, uh, we're actually not seeing it, we're actually really doing it. Um, so just you know, I think uh, Microsoft embracing the open source, not only open source our own stuff, like the .NET Core, that really open sourced, that's a big thing. We not only open sourced it, we also provided cross-platform support for both Linux and Mac. I think that's really welcomed by the developer community. And also we're betting so much more on open source. We wouldn't believe how many open source technology we're enabling on our um, cloud platform. For example, like Docker and uh, um, the newly announced back in April, uh, Microsoft had build conference, we announced the Azure Container Service which was built on Apache Mesa. And, and, and also, um, if it comes to the, this community, you know, Microsoft announced uh, support for um, OpenSSH. And we're also contributing back to the free BSD community on the OpenSSH. So um, that's, hopefully I give you guys some idea, you know, Microsoft is really um, trying to be open and, then to, and trying to accelerate the investment in that space. Okay, um, now, so, Microsoft loves Linux, Microsoft loves FreeBSD, you know, I'm very glad to say that um, in, uh, in front of everybody, you know, um, I, I used to be a Red Hat certified engineer. When I joined Microsoft, I, 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 took, I took that out from my resume <laughs> years ago, and I'm actually very proud now to say I'm a Red Hat certified engineer. <laughs> okay. so, um, so what does that, I mean, why does Microsoft like, love Linux, right? So I think uh, Linux and loves FreeBSD. Um, I'd like to share, a, just, just get you guys, you know, understand where we come from. I think a couple things. Uh, first of all, FreeBSD, hope you all agree, it's a very performant and stable you know, uh, OS. And with that, uh, you know, it has actually pretty good advanced feature on the network security and storage, right? That's number one. And number two, I think uh, one of the key reasons also is because license, right? It's, uh, it's copy left and wise GPR license, and that really gives us a lot of freedom to innovate in the kernel space without having to really contribute back or to the competitor. And also, I think one of the key reasons is the appliance vendors. I don't know how many of you are here um, in that group, but um, clearly the whole physical um, appliance market is uh, shrinking, year by year declining. Um, a lot of them is moving into virtual appliance space, to leverage the cloud, and really that reduces the development cost and the infrastructure cost as well as the manufacturing cost. And that trend is just going up uh, year by year. And with that, I think um, Microsoft really like to um, provide the best cloud platform, whether it's on our private platform, which is based on Hyper-V technology, or Azure, which is also uh, powered by Hyper-V, to have the best cloud platform to embrace that trend and let the um, appliance vendors to have the cloud platform to really, you know, uh, expanding their virtual appliance business and also meet their customer demands. So that really is the, uh, the drive behind Microsoft to really, we are, um, we love FreeBSD, obviously. Now, um, having said that, you know, let's take a little bit of a moment. You know, we're saying that today, you know, um, Microsoft loves FreeBSD. The journey really started not today, a couple years back. So if we look at it, back in 2012, we already started the first uh, um, kick of the project. At that time, we worked with the Citrix and the NetApp and made the first uh, version of the, we call it BIS, FreeBSD integration services on Hyper-B to be working. It was a bell minimal working version, but at least it was a breakthrough. Um, that was back in 2012. 
the moving forward, throughout these years, we've been always enhancing the the free uh, the, 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 the the this code. So in 2014, I remember that was in uh, Microsoft's Ignite conference in um, Barcelona. We announced the official support of 10.0 for um, Hyperd. Hyperd official support of 10.0, and, um, and and uh, and that was the also we published all the support matrix for all the, the different FreeBS versions in our public uh, technical website. And through this year, you know, the team is continually to enhance the code, and uh, we also, you know, contribute the core functionality as well as the network side of the performance to the FreeBSD projects. So we actually worked uh, in the last year. We worked with a couple of virtual appliance vendors. It's listed here to um, onboard their virtual appliance in the Azure marketplace. I'll explain Azure a little bit in the later. Well, Azure is our Microsoft uh, public platform, and uh, and there's more coming um, this year. And uh, um, and later we we'll have um, uh, we'll have NetGate come to do a demo here, and uh, um, through this process, you know, our effort, engineering effort, has very much focused on optimized performance. And one of the things I like to share is that we actually optimize the network performance now. In a in a ten gigabit per, uh, per second environment, we're able to reach more than nine gigabit per second uh, uh, performance right now. And uh, um, there's a session specifically drilled into detail about how we accomplish that later um, later this week, Friday. Okay, so um, I think we have more, you know, more partners, and we'd love to work with more partners as well to um, to onboard to the uh, to our platform. Now, um, this is the moment I'd like to um, spend a few minutes on that one. So today, um, I am just uh, super excited to announce that we're going to make the um, FreeBSD 10.3 image available as a already made VM image on Azure Marketplace. What that means is. Uh, you can easily download a already um, made image that works well with the uh, um, Microsoft public platform and easily quickly stand up a VM that runs via FreeBSD. And what that also means is it's curated, you got technical support behind it. Microsoft has support engineer behind it if you have issues on this one. Yeah. And I really like to want well, to thank Deb, Glenn, and um, Ed, I don't know, we have not met, okay. You know, we always be in email community, have never really met in person, but really wanted to thank for your guys' support and partnership to make this happen. It's, a, it's, a, it's been a couple of years at work to get this to this point. So, um, so great news here. All right, um, so with that, I, I want to um, come back to and talk about the Azure. Um, first of all, I want to know, how many of you heard of Azure? Wow, <laughs> I'm, I'm very happy because years back, you know, it was like only one or two hands. Uh, now let me ask another question. How many of you have used Azure? Okay, five of the All right, you know, we, we're going to make you, make you to work on that one. We have a hackathon tomorrow, tomorrow night, I think 6.30. So we will we'll have free pass going out and you can just really try it out, okay. Um, you know, everything starts with a little snowball right now. Um, we have patience. So I think uh, if you look at the um, Gardner's quadrant, uh, um, actually Microsoft become a leading public cloud provider in multiple uh, areas, like the IS, PaaS, hybrid cloud, private cloud. So I think, um, take a step back, now, Microsoft has been providing platform, being a platform software company for a long time. However, um, we, we realize in this high tech industry, really we don't respect tradition. By the way, this is a quotation from our CEO. You know, we just cannot be complacent, you know, and we learned many lessons, we made many mistakes. So the so only thing really get us out of here is innovate. We just can't, uh, we just have to be humble and really innovate to heck out of it. And on the, you know, for the public cloud, we were not the first one started it, but we're really, really catching up. We're really, really persistent. And uh, we're trying to learn from every customers we have, you know, and that's why we're so embracing the open source community and developers. So we are, we are, we are actually now are one of the leading public cloud providers. That's a journey, and uh, we, um, it's a partnership as well with developers, with customers who are using ours, or who are interested, you curious about a platform. So um, I'd love to continue that partnership with this group of audience. Okay, uh, so, so that's uh, um, Azure's, uh, um, uh, you know, where, where, where the, uh, where the, uh, the uh, Garner says about us. Just drew a little bit about the momentum um, I know you probably have heard about Azure, but um, I, I want to share some more details about where Azure is at today from a business perspective. Um, 
I think uh, you, you look at the data, you know, um, one thing, there's a lot of data here, and there's like a number of SQL uh, database usage, you know, object storages, as well as the Active Directory users, but I think one thing I want to call out is um, we have 120,000 new users every month. 120,000 users every month. That's something uh, probably any site, you know, media size or small size would dream for. And that's the kind of momentum we're building, and that's that's the drive for us to behind innovating to really make those customers happy, and get more customers to take advantage of our platform. And uh, um, our revenue growth has been <coughs> triple digit year over year, and uh, compared to AWS. And uh, um, so that's a, that's a huge <coughs> momentum that's behind the Azure. Now, put the business side ahead. Let's talk about what is Azure. Um, so. I, I will start with a couple of areas. First of all, I think when you run a public cloud service, it's actually very, very expensive. Every year we'll put billions of dollars <coughs> put in the data center. Uh, that's why there's not a whole lot of companies doing this large scale, high scale kind of the public cloud service. When you offer a public cloud service, you need to have a like footprint almost globally. You're providing global services. That's called high scale. And guess, guess how many uh, data centers we have today? Anybody here guess? 5,000. <laughs> 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 you know, just think about it. Every data center has more than thousands, hundreds of thousands, like 100K server racks, right? So um, we have 100, more than 100 data centers and across more than 30 regions globally. And we, we have service available in um, 140 countries with 10 language support and the 24 currencies. Um, this is just a um, humongous you know, networking infrastructure topology, you know, almost operation DevOps, so you can imagine. Good thing is Microsoft has some experience in that when we run the Hotmail exchange services. But that's not enough. I mean, it's the whole cloud is a whole new game. Every day we're learning. Every, you know, we, we, we make mistakes along the way. Um, that's where we learn um, and try to feel fast and move forward. So this is our global footprint, and that including heavily regulated country like China. We have also data center in China uh, running. Um, and uh, it's a different model. You have to work with third party to be able to have a license to run it, but we're there, and we're quickly expanding our footprint as well in all of the world. So that's the high, high scale. Just so as comparison with AWS and Google, the size of the scale is two and a half times of what AWS have today, and seven times what Google has. Okay. So that's high scale. Then another thing is enterprise grade. Um, you know, enterprise actually is in Microsoft's DNA. Um, started with well on-premise box product. So we carry that DNA into um, into the cloud uh, area as well. Now when you say enterprise cloud, it's easy to set. It's actually very hard to get done. When you say enterprise grade, it really talks a lot about highly. You know, um, the expectation is very high. The reliability. You know the uh, the 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 fail, you know, all the reliability and all the recovery system as well as the quality, the performance is all much higher. That's all you uh, expected to be way higher. Now, so, um, so on the enterprise side, you can see the data we have here is uh, we actually today have like more than eighty percent of the Fortune five hundred is using on cloud, which is a com combination of the private cloud and public cloud. And just for public cloud, more than fifty percent of the Fortune five hundred uses uh, um, Microsoft's public cloud. Now, um, so you know, every day we are we are you know working hard to get that SLA. You know, most of our service is like 9.9, .9 and some of the 9.95, and we're trying to get in 9.99. Actually, for next cycle, we really want to aim some to be 9.59. Um, it's a it's it's really really tough job. I'll tell you guys, you know, you know we have live incidents, outages, and people on phone calls many times. But we are persistent, and this doesn't work in, and we can get it right. Um, and that's why we're winning our customers you know, every day. Now, having said that, enterprise world, it doesn't mean we're going to ignore startup. Actually, Microsoft, uh, if, you ever, if any of you talk to Microsoft employees now today, we're so, um, now the, the startup has become such a love child now because um, they represent a lot of new trends and also like the open source usage. And we actually have a lot of programs catered to the startups have them onboard into the Azure platform. Like we have our BizSparks, if you ever heard about BizSparks programs, just cater and also a lot of accelerators around the world uh, in different spots. Like we have one in Seattle, we have one in Israel, we have one in actually in Shanghai, in Beijing as well, and we also in Shanghai just to help startups to really uh, 
get the technology and give us feedback as well to onboard into the Azure platform. Okay, so that was uh, two features of Azure, number one, hyperscale, number two, uh, enterprise grade. Then move to the third feature, is hybrid. This is probably one of the most unique features of the Microsoft Cloud. You know, many cloud providers will make you choose. Either you have to choose your own enterprise data center or hoster, or public cloud. And guess what, Azure does not. We actually provide you know, a very seamless kind of the service on-premise and on-premise. And for those of you who need the data to be kept on-premise for regulatory reasons or for security concerns, you can keep doing that. And you can use Azure for your like uh, disaster recovery, backup, and for like bursting scenarios. And with Microsoft's heavy investment in the consistency between on-premise cloud and the public cloud, we actually are leveraging a lot of our technology from what we've learned operating this uh, 100 data center globally, applying back to our on-premise, and give, the, uh, give to the enterprises who have their own data centers or hosters who have, were running similar operation but on a smaller scale. So if you ever paid attention, well, like Azure Stack comes up, you know, all this technology helps you have the same, same plane of glass to manage your application, development, deployment operation from both on private cloud and public cloud. And that makes it a lot easier for some company to work or have to be in that boat that it has to be hybrid. And by the way, the hybrid has really become a tendency. Um, a lot of companies, they can't just completely get rid of the on-premise things and move to a public cloud. And so uh, yet public cloud offers certain benefits that they want to take advantage of it. So, um, so this is one of the unique things about Azure, that's a hybrid cloud feature. And, and move to the last one, which is not the least one, Azure is open flexible platform. You know, um, one data I want to share is, which is kind of hard for people to believe is, in our public <coughs> Azure, just go over all this air together, we have almost 30% of our VM running Linux or OSS. Believe it or not, yeah. Worldwide, we have, we have that many, uh, just all the VMs that you classify them, they're running non Windows. And, and in China, where I came from, in our data center, we have more than 50% of the VMs all running open source. It's, it's very hard to imagine coming from a company that's identified as Windows company. So, <laughs> um, so I, I think you know, um, Microsoft really, I, I clearly realized that, which is uh, which is kind of a taboo for a while. But now we say we're not just a Windows company. We're really, you know, we're really a cloud service provider. So, um, so we need to be open and flexible to customers, whatever customer wants. If that makes sense. We we'll support it. So um, now uh, let's quickly, quickly high, you know, five minutes pitch about what Azure is, and um, now let's drill a little bit to the Azure Marketplace because that relates to this announcement of FreeBSD and where it hosted is. Now Azure Marketplace is like one um, one stop shop for all the applications. So you have dev services, data applications as well. <laughs> it hosts actually both first party and third party thing, uh, solutions, and the third party all have to go through like certif certified process. And that's where a lot of the ISVs and SIs and also the commercial applies vendors can monetize them at this marketplace. And also, it, you can see, later I'll show, there's a lot of the um, non-Microsoft stuff um, going on there that's the offer to the broader audiences. And they are all being uh, integrated with Azure, so you can easily deploy. You know, you can just quickly, uh, I'll show you an example, you can quickly deploy uh, from the marketplace to the Azure platform. So um, now, where um, how's the marketplace going? So we, we showed this picture earlier about our data center uh, distribution. Now marketplace actually is available in 18 countries, and we're quickly trying to populate to other regions as well. So um, the worldwide uh, community of the ISVs and SIs could really benefit from it. So now let me switch to do a quick demo um, about this uh, about this. Uh, so first of all, let me kind of start from the very beginning. How do you find our marketplace? Because I don't know how many of you went to our marketing portal. So it's not showing. Uh, there you go. Thank you. So um, if you go to our, uh, if you go to our. Uh, Azure portal, which is very easy to remember, windowsazure.com. Here's our um, home page. This is the place where you can find a lot of stuff. Pricing information, documentation, product <coughs> services we announce, uh, we have, we offered, and it uh, announces. So if you go, come here. So you, if you come here to the Partners tab, 
here you can see this marketplace partners. Then let's go to the go to the marketplace. So this is the um, the marketplace I just mentioned about. You can see if you scroll down, there's so many categories. You got like virtual machines and you know, developer services, uh, API apps, Active Directory applications. There's a lot of you know you can uh, every app has a uh, has a name like a, this. For for example, for API apps, this <coughs> Office 65 is coming from Microsoft. Yet, you know, if you look at other things, it's like all coming from third party, uh, where they contributed, the, they brought the service on top of the Azure Marketplace. Web apps, you can move down data services, there's a lot more total. We have like, today we have, actually, when I was looking at it yesterday, it was like 3,600 and now 3,700 7, apps. So let's look at for free VS, the, the image I just announced. <coughs> There you go. So 10 times 3, the one we just announced, it shows up in the marketplace. So here, you know, this is what I would talk about. It's easy to, uh, once you have something in the marketplace, it's very integrated into Azure. You can easily deploy and create a VM on this one. So now, you know, I, I was just in the market, uh, on the, on the uh, marketplace portal. Now I found this image I like, and I said I want to create a virtual machine. And it will, so a couple of things will happen when it happens. Number one, if I do have a subscription already, which I do, it will bring me immediately to my, uh, to, to this management portal, which we can perform a lot of management related functions. And if you have a subscription but you have not logged on yet, it will prompt you for your Azure subscription, okay? And the third scenario, you don't have anything on Azure. You just browse your web, our website, you find this cool thing, you want to deploy it, and it will actually bring you to a page that asks you to um, register, to, to, to create a subscription on that one. And uh, um, actually, uh, also, you know, I meant to show you earlier, Azure actually has, uh, look at this page, uh, we actually have free trials going on here. You can set up free trial account. It gives about 200 bucks of credit for one month. You can try anything within this time frame. It does ask you for credit, credit card information. Now later, when we do the hackathon tomorrow, we have some free pass give up, which does not ask you for credit card information, and you can try things out. So um, I encourage you guys to take advantage of it. So here's a free BSD you know, I, I was able, because I have an account here, and I was directly uh, got guided into my uh, management portal. So you look at this, this is the, um, the page, and I can, here's the, can you guys see it all? Is that better? So here's like an you know, image describes all the image stuff, and here you can see, and I can see, um, I, I, we're all using resource manager. This is the classical is kind of getting replaced by resource manager, and you can see create, and and then it starts to take you through all the uh, basic steps, step by step, one, two, three, four steps to create an image. You know your name, you know, and uh, the the image's name, and uh, what how do you want to get access to it, and all that stuff. So. Um, to spell the time, so I will use a one that we already created already. I'll show you uh, what that is. So I have a the B, free BSD uh, VM using the 10.3 that's just announced image we have created. It was very plain vanilla uh, VM. So you, you come to this uh, VM that I created. You can look at it. Okay, let's see again. I'll make it a little bit larger again. For people in the back, so you can see this is a this is a free BSD running and it is using a certain size of the uh, VM. Which by the way, you get a chance to choose when you create a VM what kind of a VM size you want it. And uh, um, a couple of things I want to show here. Uh, so you can show like uh, um, boot diagnostics, and this shows all the boot information. So in case you need to uh, troubleshooting on this one, give you a little bit of time to bring it up. Um, yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. So this is all the you know all the all the boot information here, and now um, uh, this is from the UI. I'll show you later. You can also log into the VM as well. This is all the information here. And then another thing I want to show you is you actually can I mean all this admin work you can do from UI. You can also from do it from command line. So reset password. Uh, you know I think many of us you know uh, probably need that reset the password. And when I say this, uh, I need to introduce a concept called extensions. 
So there's the extensions that which really provides a way for you to apply a lot of script to your VMs in Azure. And it's very powerful, you know, you can do, you know, VM access, which is extension, allows you to just reset password. And there's other extensions as well. So you can, you, can, you can access this extension from your UI to reset your password. And also, um, you, can, um, you can add extensions here as well. Here you can see, hey, I want to add extension. We have like probably a dozen extensions you can really add. You know, and you can add extension here as well. You can like add here to add other extensions. Yeah, there's a bunch of extensions you can add in the backup, in a custom script, all this one. However, I will give you a caveat. Um, caveat. I, I, I meant to talk about it later, but I can give you guys an upfront. So not all extensions we have on the, on, the, on, the, on the Azure is attributed to FreeBSD because of the variance of the FreeBSD from different vendors. So, um, so later when I talk about publishing, you have to make sure you're on the whitelist so it doesn't show up all the VM extensions. So now let me uh, find a way to log into the VM that I have. Let me use Putty to get onto the. Um, so let me get the type of IP address here, which is 104.41.159.157. And uh, let's log on. So I think. Uh, Okay, there you go. So I let me blow that out a little bit, and uh, let me see if I can make this bigger. You guys can see it all. Oh my God, it's so dark on the back, right? We recognize it. You, know, <laughs> <laughs> you have to. This is so familiar, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so you can now you can check it out. Say, hey, you know what is this? You can. It, it, no, it is a FreeBSD to turn out straight. So I'm, I'm, I was not lying. It's true. It's already up and running here. For many of us, once you see this screen, it's like, ah, oh, I feel comfortable now, right? I can do a lot of things I <laughs> command line user on that one. <laughs> All right, so um, that's uh, my quick demo about you know just to how you can quickly, easily to spawn off the uh, FreeBSD based image on this one. So let's back to my, um, I hope seeing is believing, you know, um, we really do some work to make the life easier. <laughs> For, for, all, for all of us. So um, I kind of show the marketplace, right? I want to talk about it now. If anybody's interested in how you want to publish your stuff to the marketplace, a quick you know, process on this one. It's actually pretty simple. First one, you, you need to kind of submit an application about you know, what your company is and what your application or solution is, a brief description. Then it gets to Microsoft and they do evaluation of waiting for approval. And that's just all paperwork. And once you got approval, then you get a, a become a, a make yourself to be a publisher. And that's the detailed instruction about how to make yourself as a publisher. And you have to upload some of your technical assets and some of the marketing information as well. Then the third thing is we actually do the testing for you. Make sure it actually really works in the Azure environment. Then you can you can, we can publish it. And the last step is actually we can do some go to marketing uh, work together uh, to help you to promote your solutions in a marketing place. So at the heart of this is very simple. Actually, you know, if you look at the uh, website, there's a whole page about it. I have the URL here, but I'll, I also can show you um, this whole publishing process. Uh, the, this shows you, it depends on what you are publishing a VM image, or it's a developer service, or it's a data service, or it's a solution template. Uh, there's all different uh, processes you can go through, and uh, uh, basically for us all summarize the four steps and it helps you to guide you through this process. So make your solution available on the uh, Azure Marketplace. All right, so um, back to this one. Now, uh, now we kind of shared this um, Marketplace. So I mentioned we have a couple of, we've been working hard with a couple of virtual client vendors to make this solution available on Marketplace. So uh, we actually have five now as of, uh, as of today, you know, um, we start. We have uh, we we have Citrix Net, uh, Netscaler we have VPX on that one. We have Storm Shield Network and, and, and Security um, um, on on our marketplace. We also have the um, Jamal. I'm trying to say how to see. Anybody know how to see the company name? Jamalto. Jamalto. is a safe net network uh, protect uh, protect uh, 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 the clients, the virtual clients on the marketplace as well. Then we have. Um, we have a network networkers actually. Um, the Azure VP, uh, VAP is the ADC um, 
uh, place on the marketplace. And our latest member actually is from uh, NetGate, PFSense. And Chris will come up to do a demo, there you go, later. Okay, so, and we'd love to work with more of you to have more of the solutions available on the uh, marketplace. Now, uh, let me uh, introduce Chris. Uh, she, he's a co-founder of, PF, um, of PFSense to show the uh, well, co uh, to show their uh, appliances, how they work on the Azure, their journey with the three based on Azure, and as well as how that the virtual appliance usage is for public cloud users. We have a Chris Beekler, I'm a founder of PFSense. Um, most of you have seen me around here for a, a, a bunch of years now at this point. I, I'll give my uh, intro spiel anyway. Um, we're a, a web managed FreeBSD based firewall distribution. Uh, we've been at it for almost 12 years now. And I've grown to one of the most widely used, uh, or probably the most widely used open source firewall distribution. Uh, Current release is, uh, is 231, we're at FreeBSD 10.3 base. We're uh, doing a better job as we've grown and scaled at staying up with, uh, with where FreeBSD is. Uh, but in the past, it had been difficult and kind of gotten stuck on uh, older release versions. It's not uh, really the case anymore. And, uh, Luis and Renato are, have been working on uh, 11, actually, so our next uh, release will be, uh, will be based on 11 once we get to uh, like a 2.4. Uh, for probably about a year and a half now, we've been working uh, with, with Microsoft on getting the, uh, an Azure image uh, out there. We've had one uh, available on Amazon AWS for two, three, four years maybe now, and uh, been working through the process um, with them, and finally have it launched and available uh, about three weeks ago or so. So uh, public cloud, why would you need or want to use a, a firewall virtual machine? Uh, you know, they have built-in networking capabilities that does routing and, and ACLs and their VPN services available. Uh, well, largely I'm going to speak from my experiences uh, with, with Amazon since we've only been doing this for three weeks but it, on uh, Azure, but the, in, the, in those three weeks the, the use cases have largely been the same as, as what we've seen people wanting on, uh, on Amazon over the years. Uh, VPN is, is generally the most common one. Site-to-site uh, -site VPN is probably the most common type of that. So Microsoft offers a, a built-in site-to-site option that, that you can configure you know, within the, the management portal and 
and run that way. Um, much the same with uh, what people have been doing with Amazon, but that also has a, an hourly cost associated with it or a monthly cost depending on um, how you do it. And depending on the specifics of your network and how many locations you have, uh, that can start to add up to more and more costs for every single location that you have. So uh, people have become comfortable with using PFSense for their VPNs and they see they can run one VM instance and then VPN in X dozens or hundred or however many sites back into that single instance and have a significant cost savings in, uh, in some cases, depending on what their, what their network is like. So rather than resorting to something like route all the branch offices back through the headquarters and then the headquarters out to Azure to try to save money and not bring up all these individual VPNs and then adding latency and, and reducing your performance in the process, uh, you can VPN all your locations straight back into a, a single PSN instance and uh, have the, the best connectivity that <clears throat> uh, latency wise at least and performance for most people's purposes is more than adequate. Uh, mobile VPN is uh, yet another common type where uh, pr probably the most common usage of that is maybe a service provider who's offering an application to their customers and the servers and the data and everything lives in the public cloud and they don't just want to open it up over the internet. Um, so they'll set up something like OpenVPN or uh, we also have a variety of uh, different types of IPsec that are supported. So their customers can VPN directly into uh, the Azure in that, in that case. So they have the uh, also reasonable performance in that case so you don't have to have mobile users who VPN into headquarters and then route back out through uh, to the cloud. Or in the case of if you're a service provider, then you don't really have a, a headquarters that people can, can connect back into. So, uh, routing NAT and firewall is another of the, the more common use cases. The, those are all accommodated as well within Azure. You can set up pretty much everything that you would want. Um, in some cases, there's maybe not as much flexibility, depending on what you're trying to do, uh, versus what PSNs would allow you to, to configure. There's some degree of black box, whether it's Azure or Amazon or, or any of the other ones, where you, you lose some degree of visibility and, and control once it goes over to the uh, router that's uh, in the cloud. So everything that's in Azure is on a carry grade NAT Submit that uh, Microsoft assigns, and then you can do uh, you can assign a public IP to a, a specific device, and then basically the in the the cloud there the the one to one that happens, so it, it's translated from that CGN IP to the public IP that's assigned to the the VM. But public IPs are on IPv4 are a limited resource, and Azure and most other public clouds at this point don't support IPv6 yet, uh, so. Rather than racking up additional hourly charges for more and more public IPs, uh, some people end up using PFSense to NAT everything out of just one IP because there is a, uh, some degree of hourly charge involved for um, your IPs, the public IPs. And some more for firewall, and there are ACLs available you know, within Azure that you can configure and probably suffice for, for most people, but uh, there are probably a, there's a lot more flexibility if you're using something like PSNs to be able to uh, control the firewalling much much easier probably than what you can in in Azure. And then one of the other use cases is um, testing and simulation. We have uh, dummy net and PF, uh, which we call limiters, which if you're testing your application uh, and you have it running in Azure in your your test environment and uh, yeah, it, it probably works great with 10 gigabit between the machines, but you know, what if it's uh, 500 milliseconds of latency on a 256k link with uh, a half a percent packet loss? Uh, that's not something you can really configure in Azure itself, uh, but you can configure limiters between the systems and then test that circumstance um, all contained within your regular test environment in Azure. Now I'm gonna run through a quick demo. 
I've got a machine running already. Um, but the process of, of getting one started is you know, much the same as, uh, as what we went through on the, the FreeBSD one there. You search for uh, PSNs comes up on the marketplace. You can hit the launch it. Uh, you tell it what the password is. You give it an SSH key optionally. And it boots up, sets the password. Uh, and then you can find your IP within the, uh, the Azure portal there. And then you log in and you've got uh, the system there. And I, I pre-configured an OpenVPN setup. And this is just a, a single interface. Uh, you, you may end up with, if you have uh, several virtual networks or uh, <coughs> you may have several interfaces there, this is just kind of a, a simple default single interface device which can route VPN traffic right back in. That's, that, that's kind of one of the differences in a VPN appliance um, in public cloud. Uh, a lot of times you do only have one interface where in the real world you'll have a LAN with a public IP and a LAN that has a private IP. Uh, the, the public to private translation is, is handled by Azure itself um, and then you may, uh, depending on what your, your network config is like, you probably have other systems that are on that same IP subnet there, so it just routes it back in, out the same uh, interface it came in on. So we have an OpenVPN client export utility. I just set up a basic remote access server. The, the wizard walks through that in you know, a matter of five minutes or so. And then once you go to the client export, I have a user defined. And since it is translated, then I, I need to put in what the real IP is. So when it exports it, it has the correct address. And then there's my Azure user, and I will demo the viscosity. So when I extract that, I've got the uh, profile that's ready to import. And I can just go into Viscosity. Viscosity is a nice uh, OpenVPN client commercial, uh, but it's like nine bucks per license. And uh, it's got some nice bells and whistles that uh, the freely available clients don't that kind of make it easier to use for people. And I'll just import that, uh, that file that I just exported. And then I have my Azure Load Access, which is what I named it when I set it up. So before I connect to that, so my IP currently is uh, out of the university here. So I've got it set up in such a way that it's going to route all of my traffic over that, uh, which some people actually just use as a Hey, there's a nice way that I can set up a machine somewhere else that's outside of my network that, you know, when my users are out at a coffee shop or something, they can route all their internet traffic out through this. shows you you're in Ottawa and University of Ottawa IP and now you see Microsoft and it thinks I'm in Iowa because I'm sure that machine probably is in Iowa that's where it's this is spread in central US so and I was getting uh, somewhere between 10 and 20 down and almost 10 up earlier outside the VPN and when I tried it inside it was basically exactly the same speed getting quite good performance for at least for what I'm able to get on the Wi-Fi here on this machine. So that's what that thing like looks like if you actually have Flash installed. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> yes, I have flash, but I do have to right click first and fill it to run. <laughs> And some of the other features that people get, I mean, that basically any feature you can use in a, a physical environment, you can use in a public cloud as well. Um, some people use some of the load balancing functionality rather than using what's built into Azure itself. If you're going to build the next Facebook, that's probably not the, the best idea. Um, what's you know built in there is, it seems to be nice and robust and massively scalable. But if you want something that's Simple and straightforward. Um, some people prefer to run the uh, our, our built-in load balancer that's uh, based on Relay D. Variety uh, of other services. Uh, in this case, I'm getting DNS via the DNS order on this system. Uh, DHCP does not really have any applicability here because the Azure itself handles it. Uh, in that case, also an NTP server. But for the most part, it's back to those just more limited use cases that, uh, that I talked about, the routing, the, the NAT, the firewall, uh, and VPNs. VPNs is the, definitely the most common one. So I want to thank Microsoft for you know, what they've done to, to bring support for FreeBSD and uh, yeah, we've, we've all seen how difficult it can be sometimes with commercial software vendors, especially ones that have a perceived reputation like you know, Microsoft might. Uh, but they, they've, they've really done very well at, at uh, bringing FreeBSD support, continuing to you know, have committers that are uh, pushing it along and, and fixing things that come up. So um, thanks very much uh, for, for what you've uh, done. Thanks. Performance-wise, uh, how well does it do with, uh, you know, high FPS uh, loads and stuff? Uh, for like with VPN or just yeah, high FPS and yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I really haven't gotten in any great depth <coughs> and significant performance. Um, I'm guessing it's at least comparable to physical hardware, so it. I, I have done some testing in Hyper-V, so it should be comparable to that. You should be able to get you know, at least several hundred megabits per second out of the smallest um, one for, for VPN purposes, you're probably limited, if it's IPsec, you're probably limited by the inherent um, scalability limitations in, in FreeBSD IPsec. Uh, even like the, the fastest servers that we could round up will only be like four gigabit with a null cipher. Um, so that's that, that's probably your upper upper limit in that case, but uh, everything seems to perform quite well. I, this is the, the running the smallest um, size instance that's available. And when I was on a faster connection, I was getting much more through the VPN than I get on the smallest instance from Amazon. <coughs> so that's seems to work very well. It's also a significantly more expensive instance than what <laughs> the smallest instance on Amazon is. So it's not exactly a, exactly a fair comparison, but it, it's. In my experience, it performed very well. Uh, yeah. So what about packets per second? And so, as sort of a follow-up, is, is there anything that's like an SR, SR IOD, uh, you know, device that you can use rather than using a fully virtualized device? Uh, not in the public cloud use case, um, at least that I'm aware of. So that would be more like if you're running it on your own Hyper-V server that's you know, private cloud. Type of thing. Yeah, packets per second, I think, is pretty comparable to um, physical hardware. We've only had this available. So, yeah, I mean, you're, you're not going to touch. If you have PF enabled, you're probably not. You, you might hit a million packets a second. Um, if you have enough cores to, to do that, you might probably need about four cores or so to, to get to that point. Um, 
if you disable PF, then things are considerably faster. But still, I don't know that uh, that FreeBSD will hit you know line rate at 64 bytes uh, at 10 gig, um, unless you're maybe doing something like NetMap. I haven't really done a whole lot of performance work in Azure yet because we we've just gotten it out there and, and available. Um, there is full IPv6 support in PFSense. There is no IPv6 support in Azure. Uh, <laughs> sure. Welcome to the future. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just like the past. Well, you're a good company, AWS. Yeah, yeah AWS doesn't somebody either. Somebody might have it by now. I, yeah, I was hoping that, you know, Azure got kind of a, a late start relative to, to Amazon. I was hoping, hey, maybe they'll launch with IPv6. Hey, uh, Frackspace has IPv6. Or DigitalOcean, or yeah, there's a a number of them that, that, that do. Nice demo and explanation. I hope uh, through Chris's demo, you feel like uh, actually it's pretty easy to use Azure. You know, even though we had a perception before, I think we're changing. And um, and also you can see what the kind of potential you can do with uh, FreeBSD based products on uh, 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 in terms of scenarios. Um, all right. Uh, for the next couple of uh, um, probably 20 minutes, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about what's going on behind the thing. You know how. Um, if you have your own your own FreeBSD image that's highly customized and you want to bring it up, and also um, basically also it explains how we our team has been working behind the scene to make all this possible on Azure. So I'll spend uh, uh, the rest of the session talking about that. So first of all, oh, not showing. steps to involve to make a image available on Azure. So, um, so applying to particular to the free SD, BSD context, um, you first have to get a free BSD running well on Hyper-V. Hyper-V is our hypervisor that um, powers our <coughs> on-premise uh, private cloud as well as Azure. Actually, the Azure and uh, uh, runs a similar, same uh, Hyper-V uh, technology um, that powers the underneath infrastructure. And that work actually most done by us, so I'll explain a bit more detail into that. Then you have to really configure your VM to be, um, you know, to, to 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 be ready to be used as a, a image. Then you can, then there's a whole um, concept called Azure Lin Agent that I want to explain as well. Now I, I mentioned the config VM part of it, or part of it. Too. Then you you upload it. So that's really a kind of a high level of the steps involved to get to your. Um, your, your own image, your public customer image, up running. And I'll go to each of the detail, you know, the step in little detail. So um, I'll just bring up this slide. So how really, the, how the office runs on Hyper-V? So first of all, you know, we, we support x86 and x64. If you are not in this category, I'm sorry, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a dead end. You know, if you belong to this kind of category, uh, I don't think anybody here probably is in that category here. I was probably won't be here. <laughs> um, then if it's yes, great uh, news. But even that goes two uh, two directions. If you are not have this uh, this uh, free uh, this called B um, BSD integration service, which is is really followed our uh, Linux integration service. If you don't have that in your image, then you have to use emulated uh, devices. It's still workable, but the performance is really optimized. 
and we're not, we don't even recommend that. Um, and uh, so if a bunch of, you know, you have you run in Solaris and you have like the, the list and this uh, image uh, in some Linux and BSD image without this integration service, you fall into this camp. Now if you do, now when you do, what that means is, I just mentioned earlier, starting with 10.0, we have uh, the, this included in the free BSD uh, kernel, then you are falling that camp. In once you're in that camp, life becomes much easier. We have all this uh, synthetic drives that's fully integrated with Hyper-V and uh, it really works well. It's optimized, uh, it's a performance that's been tuned, all this. So um, basically we have this kind of integration service for both Windows, Linux, and FreeBSD. Uh, so that's kind of the how operating system really, really runs on Hyper-V. If I go a little bit of detail into this build service, it's actually pretty simple. You know, Hyper-V actually presents all the hardware underneath it, regardless of what it is, as a synthetic drivers to the guest OS. Now the guest OS needs, of course, this driver to talk to the synthetic drivers. And all these drivers will develop what's called an integration service. For Linux, it's called Lisp. For, for, for BSD, we call it um, this. And uh, so uh, when this driver is really, uh, the, all this, the this service really runs inside the OS guest. And uh, they're also including other kind of the daemons that's running um, that supports that work. So that's kind of really at the nutshell what the this service is, what what ballpark of our effort is to make sure that the FreeBS image actually runs well on Hyper-V. And that's also similar work we have on Linux as well. So that's kind of the integration service. Now, um, let's talk about what changes we made to the FreeBS. We're actually trying to minimize the changes to the kernel. Um, the kernel part change is very small. You can see it's all uh, listed here, a second bullet. The most of the drivers all uh, all glued together right at the system have to be on device driver on the folder. And all this driver add together, I think we contribute, we have like about 18,000 um, lines of code um, that so far we, uh, and we also really contribute all this back to the you know, uh, FreeBSD projects. Uh, so, so this is the kind of change we'll make. Now, um, I kind of mentioned, you know, from 10.0 above, the, it automatically includes the BIS service. I'm sure somewhere, some someplace people will say, what about this, uh, old version that I have that I just love to hang to it for some reasons. Um, there's some, you know, there's always people like that and uh, we fully understand and uh, for that case, we actually have a port available. You can backport the BIS service to your, your, your versions. This couple of versions will sort of support of that and we'll chat this a little, bit, uh, a little bit later. You can do that as well. It's a similar for our Linux as well. You can just port this back manually into your package so it becomes BIS enabled so you can run a happy B. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so in terms of distributed support, it's actually a pretty typical flow. You know, we work uh, um, on the high bus for five weeks, you know, and then we upstream to the kernel, and then the different uh, um, BSD vendors pick up the, the versions of the previous and incorporate it into their product, do customization, whatever you need to do, and uh, there you go. Now, uh, for this one, I just want to talk about support a little bit. Uh, if it's a plain vanilla free BSD clutching, of course, um, you got to contact a, a wonderful organization here. And uh, um, however, it's running on, if it's issue running on Hyper-V and Azure, you come to us. And we will stand behind that. Too. Now, if the issue were related to like the particular solution that's on the marketplace from the appliance vendors, you contact them first. This helps to troubleshooting issues from high, high stack up and down. So this is actually pretty straightforward, how the support workflows. Work, uh, uh, now, um, now let's talk about the evolution of this uh, FreeBSD, you know, uh, the different versions that we have been supporting starting 10. So as I mentioned, the 10 has uh, the best building that ports available particular for this couple of versions, 8.4, 9.1, 9.2, and 9.3. Now for FreeBSD 10, as I mentioned earlier, that was the early version, you know, we worked with Citrix and that actually has the very well-known support of it and the IO performance is not really optimized. So as we invested more heavily into this, we really added more core cool functionalities. And uh, one thing I want to call out is the VM bus motor driver support that allows that every device driver has as their own channel talk to the vCPU instead of before they have to share the same, bu uh, same bus. And that really improves performance quite significantly. And there's a bunch of other enhancements we've done in 10.2. Now in 10.3, the network performance optimizing has been our focus. And I kind of mentioned, you know, we uh, we really um, improved the network performance quite a bit. It's almost, you know, similar in the physical environment performance-wise, and we also, you know, in, in enhances the couple 
the TSO uh, uh, command as well as the IRO, all these commands, uh, all these features. Okay, so this is kind of the evolution we've been investing on, just share with you all how, where we've been focusing at. Now what's coming, let's talk a little bit, I think somebody asked whether SRIO uh, we here, that's, you know, so first of all, all our projects uh, is on GitHub. So you're free, free to go there, get it, and actually we encourage you to go get it, because not everything we improve, include is being um, picked up in the kernel. Yes, with some other fixes in our GitHub, you can really go to find it out. And uh, so that's actually a benefit. So in the first year, uh, first half of this year, we really focused on network, as I mentioned. Or, you know, we enhance the VRSS uh, part of it. And in the, this is, will be all included in VSB 11, okay? And in the second half of the year, our focus is on the interaction, you know, the back, live backups and the frame buffer support and all the synthetic keyboard drivers. In the future, and you know, that's SROE is on the horizon, actually, and secure boot as well. So this is kind of, kind of our current roadmap. Now, one thing I want to emphasize is uh, however we decide our investment, it's largely, largely driven by you guys, our customers and developers. So we'd love to hear from you, you know, um, because that helps us to, to prioritize where we should invest our engineering resources are. In the end of the day, we're here to serve you guys, to serve everybody here, not to, um, you know, just not something to make up on our own. So I really encourage you go to GitHub, check it out, and give us feedback. And I have a mailing address later to, for you to contact us. And speaking of the network performance improvement I mentioned earlier, we have a senior engineer, Doshian, um, coming all the way from Shanghai as well, offering a particular deep dive session on the network performance part of it. It actually explains what are the each features help us to boost the network performance. And that is in Friday afternoon at 4 o'clock. It's probably the last session. I hope you guys are still um, around to attend. <laughs> <laughs> right? I think, uh, um, I, I mean, if you guys are here for this Saturday Star Trek thing, you should be here for that session, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, and the next few slides talks about the matrix, you know, the different BS versions as well. What are the key, you know, core function, network function, storage, memory, CPU, we are really uh, uh, supporting. And uh, I won't uh, draw into detail. All this actually published in our TechNet web network, uh, website. Uh, you can see you know, how we are uh, progressing. And uh, um, and uh, I also want to call it the Gen two. You know, uh, we are we actually right now um, we are supporting the uh, Gen one. We're going to all support the Gen two. For Gen two one, one significant support we add is U U E U E F I. And by the way, I used to work at Intel, so I know all the E F I initiatives. I'm very glad to see that happen here. Um, all right, so um, now you see, now that was kind of the best thing. A lot of things happened. Uh, um, Microsoft make it happen, and uh, you can just use the best and port another and uh, and manually port it, or just use the previous images that has the best building already. Once you've done that, actually, you say, okay, how can I um, how can I create a, a virtual machine, an Im image that has the stuffs coming? So it's actually pretty straightforward. Now, the good news is, Hackney Server from Microsoft is free. Okay, not like some of our other partners, like mail mail, it's really expensive. I was actually free. You can download it uh, from our website, official website. And um, and you can also download it. Oh, there's a ready-made VHD with FreeBS10 uh, from the uh, from the FreeBSD website. And then if you follow this instruction, it's really like very short, 20 seconds to create a uh, uh, VM uh, that's, uh, uh, that's with FreeBSD images on this one. So that's kind of how to create a v uh, VM, a uh, FreeBSD VM on Hack V. And this VM image can be used both on premise that's powered by Hack V, as well as in the public cloud, which is also powered by Hack V. So um, step two, that was step one. Um, step two is the Azure Linux, uh, this Azure agent. What this agent does is actually provides a handshaking conversation between the guest um, OS, the VM, and our uh, service fabric. Service fabric is really runs the, all the Azure um, underneath, orchestrate all the resources underneath of it. So it, it provides a couple of different functions. Actually, it's a Python based uh, um, based code right now we have. And uh, during the provision, um, at the VM provision time, it creates user account and those kind of admin work and set the host name, that kind of thing, set like, a connection. And during the running time, it actually configures the network and uh, set the SCSI disks. A timeout and also the format, the format, the mount disk, uh, format and mount the resource disk, and also configure the swap uh, space. And also extension. I mentioned earlier about extension concept. You can use this time to apply extension. You can 
apply extension to your VM or you cannot, uh, you know, that's the choice of it. And you can choose which extension you want to apply to this group of VMs. And the do deep revision, in the case that you want to just get rid of the image, reclaim the resource back, it helps you to clean up all of the stuff things over there. So that's a, a step number two. So, so again, so if you want to create your own solution and your own customized free image, first one, you know, get the best uh, in, uh, enabled image. Second one is uh, get the agent. agent. Now, once you get to this agent, now you're going to install it. The agent is available again on GitHub, and uh, uh, it's uh, you know it's uh, it's open source to, uh, code. Um, for the agent today, we have two branches. Branch 2.0 that supports Python 2.7, and for branch 2.1, we added the Python 3 support. So um, here's a couple of things I want to explain. We recommend for like a uh, um, for free BS10 and 10.1, use the um, 2.0.18 from the uh, 2.0 branch. And uh, um, there was there was reasons for, for that one. And the uh, nice thing is, I think uh, Glenn did this job. Is Glenn here? Oh, there it goes. <laughs> oh, just, okay. It did a nice job. Actually, package all this together. You can just do this simple command, the package install Azure agent. So you, you, it combines the, the below commands together. One click, you can get the you can you can get the agent installed uh, with your with your VH together. Now, if you goes um, if you are like a 10.2, uh, we recommend you use the uh, the 2.14 version from the branch 2.1. And uh, in order to get that to work installed, there's a list of commands. There's only six commands, not a whole lot, no, but you know, um, you can just get it, download from GitHub, and then you get to, um, you, you reinstall it, and you, you link it, and then there you go. You have this uh, uh, Windows agent, uh, we call it Windows agent, uh, 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 in your package, in your, yeah. So that's kind of step two, get the agent installed. So you need to get that instrumented uh, to, be able, to be able to work on Azure. Step three is configure VM. Yeah, that's pretty straightforward. In the community of CP, SSH, set up a zero console. And one thing I want to call out is Azure doesn't disable root access. I think that's like heartbreak for many of the admins. It's like, I don't have root access. Wow. Well, the good news is we actually have sudo. So you can you have your sudo to it. This is really for security reasons of it. Um, so you need to install sudo for that purpose. So pretty much with this down, your VM, your VHD file is ready to be uploaded. So step four, upload your VHD. So here's like a, a couple of steps. Um, first, of course, you need to have the Azure subscription, and you need to download the PowerShell command, or command line. Command is Microsoft's uh, cross-platform command line um, interface. And if you need a storage account, so we can host your VHD. And then you need to prepare a connection from your, you know, whatever machine you are to talk to Azure. You, you upload the PHD uh, the PHD file. So here's a command. It's actually pretty straightforward. Uh, um, it like you know, like Azure, you know, add Azure VHD, and with the destination, you can see where you're, where you're trying to add to, that's where your storage account is, and uh, where your folder is, and your VHD name is, and then you, where your local path is, where your local image is residing. And that's pretty straightforward, right? Once you upload the VHD, you create a VM, then you, you have used this add, uh, you know, Azure VM image command and the give the image name and your image is uh, uh, your image name and your, your image name was a uh, 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 that you can put in the in and you can tell the location again and you can tell the OS type and the where location of VHD is. There you go. And you get your upload it. You know this actually are the steps I was just did through the UI, right? So you have choice to use that UI or you can use this kind of the command line as well to accomplish your goal here. So that's kind of the really the um, <coughs> simple four steps to uh, to create a customized or load your own applications into the Azure. Um, quickly summarize, you know, first one, you need to have a, a BIS in enabled package. You can either download the ones already made or you can just uh, um, port you know, to backport it to, to it. And second thing, you need to configure, you know, you need to get, get the agent to be working. The agent helps you to talk to your guest OS with our Azure fabrics. Number three, you can configure your VM. Number four, you can upload a VHD. There you go. Couple of caveats I can't mention already. Now, VM extension. Not all VM extension works for free BSD right at this point. However, they all show up when you add the, uh, when I showed that the extension tab earlier, they all show up. So if you if you don't want them to show up, then some of them actually will not work. For example, like diagnostic extension actually not only work, it actually will will not function at all. You want to tell us whitelist, so we exclude you from that uh, list up. So contact us with, with that one. 
And uh, um, we have generic uh, email address here, the BSDIC. That's uh, um, you can contact, and we our team will get email. We can respond to you guys. So um, that actually pretty much concludes all um, what I want to share today. Again, I want to summarize. You know, Azure has become we love business, we love FreeBS, we love Creative Cross Platform, and we want to be a cloud provider. We're not 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 just a Windows company anymore. We really change the perception, and we're open, flexible, and we really want to be the um, cloud platform for folks <coughs> who wants to benefit, take advantage of the cloud's uh, uh, you know, a technology advantage, and reach out to more of your audience, your customers, and you know have commercialized your solutions, and uh, and we want to um, to be on that journey together with you, to uh, to really uh, make cloud a success and uh, be a revolution for a lot of companies as they uh, try to reduce their cost and improve the cloud technology. And there you go. Um, thanks, everybody, for your attention. And um, we are, we'll be here around. And actually, we have goodies, actually. Let me not forget about that. Um, feel free to come to grab this uh, cute, cute bag, you know. And, uh, <laughs> sticker on my laptop in front of everybody so you guys can remember it. Remember it. Um, I, already, I already have uh, this one, Microsoft Loves Linux, and I think this particular... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I put our uh, inclusive for the company, so uh, I'm going to just put it right next to it. It's bigger. <laughs> So um, with my foundation hat, I've seen a lot of this happen in the background. There's all been a, a ton of technical work, both by Microsoft and people in the community. But I was hoping that you could emphasize a little bit more about what it means to get into the marketplace. Because I've heard about um, the, the need to have images that are supported by real people that you can call. And to have Microsoft step up and provide that service, the first person that you call is for an person. open is a Microsoft person, That's right. right? And That's right. I'm and, really and, and to do that out. for an open source project, I think is unique and innovative. Yes. That's right. right. That's and right. I don't know when when you were talking about that came across in your presentation. I, I mean, I, I'm, that's, I'm glad you highlighted. I, I I tried to highlight it. I said you know when we have an image in the marketplace, it really means we stand behind. It's curated, and we we train our support staff. All this that's a significant commitment and investment. And the speaking from a Windows company again, right? And uh, yes, thank you for highlighting that. So I want, yeah, I want to be aware. You know, once you have the things on our marketplace, we stand behind it, and we really uh, provide the transparent first class citizen support. Behind it. Yeah, that's amazing. much with the virtual plant vendor. We didn't realize they use free APS for general other purposes. And turn out